A lot has happened in New York during Mayor Bloomberg's three terms, but one thing that hasn't changed is the annual marathon. The mayor's policies on immigration, housing, crime, economics, quality of life, and education have impacted every mile of the city, and every borough has a story. LaForge was at his office when he heard about the Boston Marathon bombings. Once he heard that many of the victims would lose limbs to amputations, his first reaction was to assure them that life will go on. Limb loss is one thing. Limb loss from a traumatic injury is, is even harder. Um, uh, and, you know, I, part of me just wanted to, to let them know that it was going to be okay, that it was going to be better, that, you know, just like me, that there is life and normal life and maybe even better than normal life uh, after, after amputation. This month on 219 West, a tale of two marathons, we're going to take an in-depth look at the end of the 12-year Bloomberg era in New York City and the beginning of a new day in City Hall. I'm Jeff Bakari. And I'm Juliette de Kayser. The election for mayor is on November 5th. Two days earlier, almost 50,000 runners will race through the five boroughs as they head to the finish line. Today, we're going to look at both races by following the marathon route. We begin with what's happened over the last 12 years and what might lie ahead no matter who is elected. Lisa Reinhardt is our guide. A lot has happened in New York during Mayor Bloomberg's three terms, but one thing that hasn't changed is the annual marathon. The mayor's policies on immigration, housing, crime, economics, quality of life, and education have impacted every mile of the city, and every borough has a story. The run begins here, in Staten Island, where over the last decade, an influx of immigrants is changing the demographic of this quiet, traditionally homogeneous borough. According to the Department of City Planning, Staten Island's population has grown faster than any other borough. Over 20% of residents were born outside the U.S. That's up from 16% in 2000. Longtime residents have seen the change firsthand. It was really white Italians mostly. Now it's changed over to a lot of Hispanics, a lot of Mexicans, a lot of um, individuals who don't speak English as their first language. Signorelli says many newcomers form communities here. There's a huge Liberian refugee population in the housing projects uh, in the neighboring area. And there's a big uh, Sri Lankan neighborhood now. So there's um, these little, I think, I guess they call it little Sri Lanka. So there's these little pockets of immigrant neighborhoods um, that I've been really surprised to see. In fact, New York City always attracts immigrants. But right now, Staten Island is the most affordable borough for many newcomers. As we go through the city, we have New York One Noticias political commentator Juan Manuel Benitez here to discuss what New Yorkers can expect from a new mayor. The first big issue is immigration. Mayor Bloomberg was considered pro-immigration in terms of better educated immigrants. What can we expect from the future from either de Blasio or Loda? Well, first of all, thank you, Jeff, for having me here. Um, I think Bloomberg was really pro-immigration, but not only for the high level of immigration, also for low level, so to say, of immigration. And that's why he went to Washington, D.C. so many times asking for immigration reform, not only for those like high-end jobs, but also for people who are here undocumented, working in low-skilled uh, positions. We can expect like a, a mayor that is going to be basically uh, for immigration. We are not expecting major uh, changes, either with Loda or with Bill de Blasio. They both talked about uh, creating some sort of municipal ID 
so undocumented immigrants have some access to certain services and also to know who's here so they can help them better. However, they're going to encounter like a lot of challenges, not only because the mayor of the city doesn't have any control over immigration policy, but also because how is this municipal ID going to be? Who is going to get it? If you're an undocumented immigrant and you're scared because you think that you're going to get deported, are you going to go to the city and ask for an ID? And are you going to give them your name and your occupation and your address? It's really difficult to know what's going to happen with those proposals. However, we can expect, like I said, a Mayor Lora or a Mayor de Blasio or Mayor Carrion that is going to be really pro-immigration, as any mayor of the city has to be, just because this city continues to attract more and more immigrants to its fabric. So basically, any mayor this coming election, any mayor moving on in, is just going to have to cater their campaign and their policies more and more towards more inclusionary type of things, like not only with IDs, but making it easy for English, second language type of uh, things, and like more family cohesiveness, like immigrant integration kind of things like that. Mm -hmm. Yes and no, because remember, uh, undocumented immigrants, they don't vote. Uh, High-skilled immigrants here with a green card, they don't vote. So the, the candidates are not speaking directly to those groups. They're trying to show some empathy for those groups. So the groups that can vote will vote for them because they're looking some empathetic mayor in the next leader of the city. So we have to differentiate those things. Uh, they don't have any control over immigration, but they have to seem really like nice or they have to show a nice approach to our immigration because otherwise who's going to survive politically in the city if you go against immigrants? Well, Loda, I see <clears throat> he's been trying to, I guess, break away from the Bloomberg type of mold. Is lately, the voting public has been kind of anti-Bloomberg, even though earlier they said they loved him so much. So I guess he's trying to become more em empathetic in terms of, because Bloomberg is seen as just business, you know, the rich is uh, work for the rich, et cetera. So how, um, how can Loda do this? It's going to be really difficult. It's going to be really difficult uh, to manage all these like ideas, uh, he's going to have two main challenges. First of all, he's a Republican in a highly democratic city that for the last 20 years hasn't had a democratic mayor. Uh, they had either a Republican or a Republican turned independent in the case of Mayor Bloomberg. So it's going to be difficult to break from the Republican Party just because the Republican Party in itself ideologically is not really popular in the city. And it's also going to be um, hard for him to break the technocrat label that has been imposed on him as Mayor Bloomberg also was uh, uh, labeled a technocrat. So those two things, he has to separate themselves from those two things and look more like a Democrat, basically, like he's been doing with his, uh, with his advertising. Now let's go back to Lisa Reinhardt with two more bor boroughs and two big issues. Quality of life issues have been big for Bloomberg. His administration has revitalized this waterfront in Brooklyn's Dumbo area, and in the rest of the city, they've added 830 acres of parkland, a bike share network, and 111 miles of bike lanes. But an unexpected challenge hit the city last October, when Sandy left a trail of flooded homes, destroyed infrastructure, and a lot of questions about how to protect the city in the future. According to the New York City Panel on Climate Change, sea levels will rise between 7 and 29 inches in the next 40 years, a big problem for Brooklyn and all coastal areas of the city. Three million homes and businesses will be in FEMA-designated evacuation zones. The mayor has rolled out a resiliency plan for future weather events with a $20 billion price tag. It will be up to the next mayor to find the funding. Rents have risen all over the city during the Bloomberg years, and Queens is no exception. 
In 2000, about one-third of Queens residents spent 35 percent or more of their income on rent. By 2010, almost half spent that much. It's a harsh reality for many tenants, like Mary Robin Monroe, a 22-year resident of Long Island City. I think the irony is that now when I come home, I see that my apartment has a price tag on it. And before it was just my home and my neighbors and it wasn't kind of pigeonholed by money. It was a beautiful place to come home to. The city rezoned the waterfront area for luxury condominiums and people like Monroe are being priced out. Housing for low and middle income families has been in short supply citywide during the Bloomberg years. In 2002, Bloomberg promised 165,000 units of new affordable housing. As of 2012, only 85 percent of those units have actually been created. There's a huge amount of diversity, and that diversity is what is uh, disappearing. Lisa just highlighted two big issues the city is facing. Let's start with the environment. What, is, uh, what does de Blasio and Lota have in terms of disaster protections, et cetera? Well, the most important thing about uh, these two candidates is that they haven't said anything against that blueprint that we just saw, uh, the plan that the mayor and his team developed for the uh, New York Post Sandy. Uh, and I think that's going to be key. Uh, they know that the next mayor is going to take uh, that uh, guide as a blueprint uh, to go forward, to move forward, the city forward in the next uh, few years and in the next few decades. Uh, this is a reality that is not ideological. It is a reality that is happening right now and the, we need to adapt uh, to the new uh, climate. The question is now where are they going to find the money? Uh, the plan uh, that Bloomberg developed uh, is uh, relying a lot on federal funds. So Loda and de Blasio, they know that they, they, if they are elected, they will have to go to D.C. and fight for that money. And uh, they are going to have to establish good relationships with uh, Senator Schumer, Senator Gillibrand, and the rest of the uh, um, Congress delegation in New York so they can get those funds uh, from Washington to really do something that needs to be done in the city. Well, in terms of developing connections, uh, who do you think, which candidate do you think has a better chance of doing that? Well, in the city, obviously, with so many Democrats representing the city in Congress, uh, it will be easier for Bill de Blasio just because, because he belongs to the same party and because he already has certain connections with those uh, politicians. Loda also has been, has been uh, uh, in politics, in city politics, for, for decades. And uh, we, we have to remember that he served under Governor Andrew Cuomo, also as the MTA chairman. So both are capable people that can develop those relationships. And at the end of the day, like I say, this issue is not uh, based on ideology, is based on reality. So both of them, there's no wiggle room. They're going to have to do whatever they have to do to get mm -hmm. the city going. Okay. And on to affordable housing. They both have presented plans, like de Blasio, I believe, has been more specific with his plans, but they both want to develop more housing for the common men. What can you say about that? They all, every time, every time someone runs for mayor, they, they try to, to give you a number of the uh, units of affordable housing that they want to create. Like we heard uh, how Mayor Bloomberg wanted to create 165,000 uh, units. And we have, sim we have similar numbers uh, with both campaigns, Loda and de Blasio. But the problem, more than creating new units of affordable housing, and the most important issue and problem they're going to face is how to preserve the units that you already have of affordable housing. Many of them are crumbling and the system is falling apart. NYCHA housing is, uh, is in deep uh, need of repairs and, uh, and they need to think forward how they're going to deal with this issue. The issue also is affordability. Not only how you're going to uh, build new units of affordable housing, but also how you're going to create a climate in the city that is going to allow uh, a, a college graduate and coming from outside the city to really live in the city and work in the city, or a working uh, class family, how they're going to be able to afford their rent or their, their house if they are uh, able to buy 
a house. And that's going to be the important part. And I think the Blasio has developed like a more concrete plan, different from Bloomberg's, trying to, to, to break away from the Bloomberg years. He wants to uh, cater to the people who are here, who are working in the city, instead of uh, uh, doing like Bloomberg did, and he's still doing, trying to attract millionaires and billionaires from outside of the city and the country to come to New York, buy and invest in mm. property here. That's a good point. Thanks, Juan. Okay, now let's go back to Lisa Reinhardt. Heading north, the Bronx is shedding its reputation as a violent and dangerous place. According to the NYPD, felonies have dropped almost 25 percent since the mayor took office. But there's been controversy over stop and frisk, which Bloomberg credits for helping lower crime rates. In August, the practice was ruled unconstitutional by a federal judge. But the mayor says without it, there will be more guns and more shootings on New York streets. Juan, crime and law enforcement, always a big issue in New York. What do you have to say about that? I think it's been the uh, most important issue in the Democratic primary, and now the wave is getting into the general uh, campaign, and it's an issue of stop and frisk. Uh, if you go outside and, and you ask New Yorkers, nobody wants to go back to the days of high crime. Uh, and uh, that would be the really complicated to go back to. Uh, however, uh, some candidates have presented a different approach uh, to safety and security and policing. And they are talking about reining in on stop and frisk. Stop and frisk is a really controversial uh, police uh, practice that is mostly affecting African American and Latino youth. And the new mayor is going to have to show some empathy uh, to those communities if uh, he really wants to uh, break through uh, the noise and really uh, get mm, the voters, uh, basically the voters, uh, vote. Uh, the, the main issue here is stop and frisk. Nobody's asking to uh, eliminate stop and frisk, but both of them are talking about how to control and do this constitutionally, because that was a problem uh, before uh, it wasn't being applied constitutionally. But I think we're going to see the same kind of police strategy. However, they're going to show a different uh, approach to the practice of stop and frisk. Well, also de Blasio and Loda sort of differ in that de Blasio will keep around Ray Kelly, and Loda wants uh, excuse me, de Blasio will get rid of Ray Kelly right. and Loda wants to keep him around. What does it say about their overall where they view the police department as it is right now? Well, this has to be more with strategy. Uh, Loda is trying to appeal to the more conservative voter uh, because he's trying to paint de Blasio as a, as a clone of Mayor David Dinkins, uh, while Bill de Blasio is trying to paint Loda as a clone of uh, May Mayor uh, Rudy Giuliani. So both of them have different approach, but both of them are trying to say, listen, you're going to be OK with me. We're going to do this differently, even though Loda doesn't want to break away from the same tactics that we see right now, and de Blasio wants a fundamental change. The finish line for the marathon is Manhattan, and that's where Lisa Reinhardt ends her report. The Bloomberg legacy may be most visible in Manhattan. Developers found a friendly environment for high-end residential and commercial projects. The city's tourism industry rebounded after the 9-11 terrorist attacks and generated over $55 billion in 2012, much of it pouring into Manhattan hotels, restaurants, and theaters. And there are big plans for the borough's future. A 73-block area surrounding Grand Central Terminal, known as Midtown East, is up for rezoning. The city wants to replace aging office buildings with state-of-the-art commercial spaces. 12 acres on Roosevelt Island was recently awarded to Cornell University for Cornell Tech, a graduate program for computer science and engineering the city council hopes will make Manhattan the next Silicon Valley. 
and $50 million was recently allocated for Culture Shed, a visual and performing arts facility planned for the borough's far west side. It's been a long run for Bloomberg. The city is cleaner, greener, and more prosperous than 12 years ago. But it's also more economically divided and less affordable for many. Whoever wins in November is already in serious training for one of the toughest political jobs in the country. Lisa Reinhart for 219 West. Juan, what of that divide that Lisa just talked about? It's a really important di divide. Um, we have to remember that and the theme that Bill de Blasio is so su successfully uh, using uh, on, on his campaign, the, the theme of uh, the tale of two cities, having tried before by other candidates in the past. However, it's resonating differently this time. Why? Because now it's not about the rich and the poor. Now you find middle class New Yorkers and working class New Yorkers really listening to that message and saying, hey, I'm one of the poor people in the city. I can't afford my rent anymore, or property taxes are through the roof, and I can't live in the city anymore. That's why that issue is resonating so much, because even though we have a more prosperous New York now after 12 years of Mayor Bloomberg, we also have a harder uh, New York for most families, middle class and working class. OK. And very quickly, Juan, what about any other issues or dynamics that we haven't spoken about yet. Well, it's really important also to know that even though we are always talking about Bill de Blasio and, um, and uh, Joe Lora, the Democratic candidate and the Republican candidate, uh, we also have minor candidates in the race. We have Adolfo Carrion, who is running on the uh, line of the Independence Party. Uh, that line was used by Michael, uh, Michael Bloomberg uh, in the last uh, three uh, election cycles. Uh, we also have Jack Hillary, that is a technology investor and uh, businessman who wants to run as a technology technocrat, basically, um, who is also putting some money into, into the race. Uh, however, we have these two uh, major uh, candidates. Uh, both of them offer some similar vision of the city, but with different approaches. And that's what's really resonating with voters, who is going to be more empathetic to the middle a New Yorker, and so far, according to the polls, that person is Bill de Blasio. Okay. Yeah, well, I think you mentioned it earlier, like empathy. That's the big, the big theme about this whole race. And both candidates, both major candidates, they're moving in that direction more and more. And I don't know. It's very tough to say who who's being more empathetic. Well, uh, I think right now we see the polls uh, moving really favorably. Uh, okay. with, uh, with de Blasio, it's, uh, and uh, Laura is going to have four weeks to really catch up. Okay. Thanks, Juan. So our guest has been Juan Benel Benitez. Thank you, Juan. Thank you. Now to the other marathon, the one that will be run two days before the election. Last year, it was canceled because of Hurricane Sandy. Security will be tight because of the Boston bombing. The New York City Marathon runners, even the most challenged, will take it in stride and all looking forward to making a statement. Jonathan Murphy has their story. Are we all ready? Ready? Let's do it. This group of runners put in 20 weeks of training for the New York City Marathon last year. But Hurricane Sandy had different plans. We were all signed up for the marathon last year, and then Hurricane Sandy hit. And you know, the expression is, you know, you're going to do something come hell or high water. Well, we were going through hell, but the high water kind of shut us down. For runner Michael LaForgia, last year was a big disappointment. But he's had to overcome obstacles before, much bigger obstacles. I woke up in the hospital, I had survived this 10-day coma, but you know, what I, what I didn't know was the worst of it was really still in front of me. In 2004, while on vacation with his wife and three kids, LaForgia came down with bacterial meningitis. The friendship hasn't changed. If anything, it's probably gotten stronger because I experienced that time back in 2004 when his wife Donna called me on January 1st and said, Mike only has a 20% chance to live. That's what the doctors are telling us. 
can you please reach out to the running crew and pray for him? And that's what I did. Polanski has worked with Mike for 14 years and ran in the New York City Marathon with him just a month before he became sick. And when I woke up out of that coma, my hands and my feet were wrapped. They had begun to, to start the, the process of, uh, of uh, sort of essentially dying off, where you lose blood flow to your extremities and the skin and limbs begin to, uh, to, to die off. After undergoing 15 surgeries, LaForge was left with two partially amputated feet. He struggled for months before taking his first step again. During rehabilitation, he decided that he would have his right leg amputated below the knee. My oldest sister tells the story when I came out of the surgery of the amputation. She ran up to me all concerned and she said, oh my God, Michael, how do you feel? And I lifted the sheet and I looked down and I said, oh, it feels great. As I had just, I had connected everything I couldn't do to that foot. Eric Schaefer is the owner of A Step Ahead Prosthetics. During their first consultation, Schaefer gave Mike and his family medical advice that he was told was impossible by multiple doctors. And the one thing he asked me was, uh, am I ever going to be able to run one day? And absolutely out of the gate, I said, I made him a promise if we were going forward in this direction, without a doubt, and within one year, we were, we were up and running his first race. LaForgia plans to make this New York City Marathon his last. And as a result, he's pushing himself to the limit. Having somebody that never wants to quit is evidently the best kind of patient. The last thing we're going to do is limit him. Uh, you know, living life without limitations is by far, you know, who we are and where we want to go with our patients. So uh, if he ran 19 miles and he was a little discovered and he wanted to go further, yeah, he should go further because if he pushes the envelope, it makes us better, it makes us go stronger, it makes us, you know, that much better of a team when working together. <laughs> LaForge was at his office when he heard about the Boston Marathon bombings. Once he heard that many of the victims would lose limbs to amputations, his first reaction was to assure them that life will go on. Limb loss is one thing. Limb loss from a traumatic injury is, is even harder. Um, uh, and, you know, I, part of me just wanted to, to let them know that it was going to be okay, that it was going to be better, that, you know, just like me, that there is life and normal life and maybe even better than normal life uh, after, after amputation. LaForge's wife Donna will be at the marathon with her three kids cheering Mike on. She's confident that the marathon will be a safe event. And I have no concern whatsoever. Um, the bullies and the terrorists that did that to the Boston Marathon are not going to do it again and they're not going to do it in New York. And they're not going to hurt Michael. I'll make sure of that. Mike saw the Boston strong response as a typical display of America's defiant response to terrorism. It's going to be interesting to see that that feel um, in the air, and that you know when we're all running this race, that there's definitely going to be part of it is you know look at us and look at us run this race proud, and and we're not going to stand down to to you know a couple of uh, lunatics that um, you know took an action like that. The 2013 New York City Marathon is expected to be the largest ever, with over 48,000 participants. The starting gun goes off at the Verrazano Bridge on Sunday morning, November 3rd. For 219 West, I'm Jonathan Moffey. That's this month's edition of 219 West. I'm Juliette de Kayser. And I'm Jeff Bakari. We'll be back next month with more stories from the five boroughs and beyond.